Okay, we are at about 35. Alright, and hit in the beautiful. <laughs> What you just saw was prototype number four of a cold plasma torch that a friend and I have been working on for the past year or so. Spoiler alert, while number four looked very cool, all that whooshing is actually a sign of it not working, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I jump to version 18, which actually works and produces a beautiful cold flame, we need to back up and first understand what these things are and what they're trying to do. First, I said these torches are cold plasma torches, and that's true. The flame that comes out of the end is a hair over room temperature and you can touch it without issue. But how is that possible and why would I want such a thing? The reason I wanted a torch like this are threefold. First, cold plasma is amazing and I just wanted to see it for myself. I'd heard about it years ago and have wanted to try and make some sense. I mean honestly, telling somebody that you made a torch that makes cold fire will have them looking at you like you're a wizard instantly. Second, while it's cold enough to touch, the plasma is full of highly reactive charged particles, and when it touches microorganisms, it rips them to shreds. So it's a powerful tool for sterilization that won't damage the thing it's sterilizing. It even kills viruses and spores in theory. And finally, all that reactivity makes it the perfect thing to do some really interesting chemistry with. For example, you can mix some CO2 into the argon gas that this is run on, and it'll convert it to carbon monoxide and O2, the former of which is a very important industrial feedstock and it'll do it at crazy high efficiencies. Or feed in a mix of CO2 and hydrogen, and it'll convert it to methane and other hydrocarbons. I'm leaving a lot out, but you can see the appeal of a thing that in theory turns air and water into fuel. Beyond that, I knew that all the skills necessary to build these torches are basically the exact same skills needed to build other hotter plasma torches and little ion engines. In fact, all of these torches are technically ion engines, just maybe not very efficient ones without a bit of tweaking. So once I have the vacuum system set up, I'll be able to quickly make some ion engines, which ought to be a lot of fun. Now, all that sounds amazing, but we still haven't discussed what cold plasma is and how we make it. Plasma is the fourth state of matter after gas. To review, a solid is atoms held together firmly, a liquid is atoms held together only very loosely, and a gas is atoms that can only interact weakly and move around freely. All the interactions in these cases are mostly mediated by the electrons orbiting the atoms. A plasma takes all this one step further. Under the right circumstances, typically when a gas gets ridiculously hot, the electrons orbiting the atoms can be given enough energy to detach from their host atoms and float around freely themselves. When this happens, the various atoms become highly charged due to a lack of electrons, and it forms a soup of charged particles. Fire is actually a really good example of this. In the chemical reaction that causes fire, an enormous amount of energy is released, allowing the electrons to come off for a moment until things cool down. You can actually see all this happen if you watch a match in slow motion. Striking the match generates sparks and a cloud of gases, and when the two mix, the chemical reaction gets going and things heat up quickly. The gas begins to glow from a mixture of black body radiation, also known as heat glow, which is proportional to its temperature, and the ionization of atoms and molecules in the mixture. For more about both, I've put a link to my spectroscopy video where we explore both in detail. However, something important to understand is that there are two sets of temperatures in a plasma, the electron temperature and the ion or atom temperature. With fire, because of the way the energy is released, the atoms themselves get very hot as the reaction progresses and the electrons whiz around crashing into things. And in fact, in most plasmas, the same thing happens. As you put more energy into it, the temperature of the atoms will rise rapidly. But we wouldn't be talking about this today if that was the only option. If you could somehow apply energy in a way that just heats the electrons and had some way to keep the atoms cold, you would still have a glowing plasma whose electrons are anywhere from 2 to 15,000 degrees, but it would feel cold to the touch as electrons lack the momentum to transfer much of that heat to a large object due to their tiny mass. The reason fire feels hot is because gases and ions are at high temperatures, and since they have more mass, they can transfer that energy to your finger more easily. Okay, now that we understand the basics of plasma, how do we make some? Well, anyone who's played with high voltage knows that a sufficiently high voltage source lets you pull long streams of plasma as soon as the wires get close enough together. What's happening there is the electrons in the wire have sufficient energy to literally shoot out of the wire and travel a fair distance in search of ground, so that they can release their energy. As the wires get closer together, some of the electrons make it across the gap. As they do this, they crash into gas molecules and ionize them, knocking more electrons free. This makes the air more conductive, so more electrons can flow. This repeats until you have a hot soup of plasma which conducts very readily. At that point, trillions and trillions of electrons can suddenly flow which rapidly heats everything up. What we want to do is take advantage of the electrons jumping out of the wire, but we need to inhibit their ability to cross the gap and form a hot arc. To give them a little extra help, we don't want to just use higher voltages. 
Instead, we want to increase the frequency of the applied voltage until it's in the low radio ranges. If we use something like a microwave transformer to generate our high voltage, it'll be running at 60 Hz. That means the voltage climbs and drops 60 times per second. Considering the distance the electrons fly is proportional to the voltage, there are these distinct peaks where more electrons are coming out and flying further. By increasing the frequency, we increase the amount of time the electrons are able to escape the wire. However, as we increase the frequency, we also start to get what are called near and far field effects. Radio is, after all, just an alternating current on a set of bare wires at its simplest. By increasing the frequency all the way into the low radio ranges, the wire now also radiates radio waves along with the electrons it spews out. These waves can themselves energize the flying electrons, allowing them to fly further and behave differently. Primarily, it easily allows them to fly free of the wire and try to find ground to release their energy. To maximize the effect of the high voltage, high frequency, we place a thin insulator between the two wires as a dielectric barrier. As the electrons leave the wire, they now hit a surface that they can't really go through. So they spread out and the insulator builds up a charge on its surface, essentially forming a tiny capacitor. If this insulator was a tube, we could set it up so that all the electrons are being spit out into a stream of easily ionizable gas like argon. The electrons would ionize the gas, turning it into a plasma, and the RF would help keep it energized. If we get the gas flow just right, we should be able to gently push this plasma out of the tube. The flowing gas makes it such that the electrons absorb most of the energy as the gas atoms just aren't exposed to enough energy to heat them up in the short time that they're in the tube. Before we go further, a word about safety. We're working with high voltages and gases which, if not handled properly, can be very dangerous. I wouldn't suggest you attempt to replicate this unless you know what you're doing. Use common sense and good high voltage practice if you intend to replicate this. With that out of the way, to build a torch around this concept is simple in theory, but very difficult in practice. The core of the torch are these 1.3mm quartz capillary tubes. We're using a flyback transformer and ZVS driver as our power source, both of which can now easily be purchased online for cheap. Flybacks are great because they run at 15 to 30,000 volts at a fairly high frequency in the kilohertz. But they're also super weird, so even though they oscillate and output an alternating current, depending on the model, the output voltage goes from zero to some positive voltage and then back to zero without really going negative. It's more like pulse DC. So you treat them sort of like AC and sort of like DC. Again, super weird, but useful for our purposes. To make a bit of cold plasma, all you do is take a capillary, put a needle down one end and a small washer or bit of metal on the outside. Connect the back end to an argon tank and each electrode to the flyback, and once you turn it on, voila, instant cold plasma. Now, if we're just going to talk about cold plasma, this would be basically the end of the video. In fact, most of the papers about this just stop here. They run their test with the capillary exposed like this and just stop. Thing is, attempting to actually utilize this in an actual functional tool is a lot harder than one might think. So now we can finally talk about model 18 and briefly what happened to the rest. I'm going to have to leave a lot of the prototyping and failures out as I've spent more than 70 hours machining parts for the various versions over the past three weeks. Many of these were failed attempts at making a torch and having them break at the last second, designs that refused to work for one reason or another, or quick prototypes like the basic exposed capillary just to test ideas, materials, and concepts. To understand the design I settled on, we're actually going to start with number 17 as it's almost identical to 18 but all the parts are see-through so we can see what's going on. The body of the torch is a piece of acrylic tubing with a 3 8 inch inner diameter. It was cut to approximate length and then trimmed to dimension on the lathe so it had nice flat ends. The back is sealed with a brass hose fitting I made that has an o-ring at one end and is the connection point both for the inner electrode and the wire that connects it to the power supply. I had a lot of fun making this part as it was the most geometrically complex part and brass is just a fun material to turn. The front end has an acrylic plug that is also sealed by an o-ring and has a small channel going down the center. Then it has a slightly wider bore at the front end. The inner electrode, which is made of a needle soldered onto some copper wire, can fit up through the channel, and the capillary can be slid down the channel over the needle once everything is assembled. This prevents you from breaking the capillary while trying to fit the needle down the hole. To make sure the capillary doesn't leak gas around its outside, which is why number 4 failed, a silicon gasket is used to plug the hole so that the gas can only come up through the tube. In number 4, you can actually see the gas being ionized outside of the tube because argon could leak through the sides. I'm using some scrap RTV silicone I had from the Gecko Tape project I'm working on to make little gaskets. I made a die to cut them out using some 2mm copper tubing with a flared end. This gasket is pressed into place and sealed by the upper electrode, which is made of a piece of brass tubing. I didn't have any brass tubing, so I just made my own. 
This tubing is in turn held in place by an acrylic shield which is meant to protect the capillary from getting bumped and snapped. The main feature of this design is that every part is quickly and easily replaceable, as what killed many of the previous designs was a capillary or other part breaking and not having an easy way to replace them. A small leak is enough to destroy one of these torches, so early versions used adhesives like epoxy to make a perfect seal. This made it impossible to fix, so after a few of those failed, 17 was made to be perfectly fixable. 18 is similar, but with a few changes. First, a spacer made of Delrin was added to the back end to make sure that the high voltage electrode was not directly touching the acrylic. Second, the front plug was replaced with an identical one made out of Teflon. This too was to make sure that no electrode touches the acrylic. The shield was shortened, the internal bore was significantly widened, and it too was made out of Teflon. I actually repurposed the front end of number 4 for this. So why did we make what seemed like superficial changes? Well, 17 had a single issue, which was that no matter what we did, we could not make plasma come out of the end of the tube. It took a while to figure out, but our theory is that acrylic is one of several materials that holds a charge very well. As the high voltage charged up the plastic, it was inducing an electrostatic charge in the shield that was literally forcing the plasma back down the tube. And we can't just feed in more gas, as too much gas kills the flame, as no ions can build up before being shot out of the tube. So 18 was meant to address all of these issues. After a bit of tuning, we had a really nice flame, and the torch was stable enough to use without fear of breaking it. Quick note about the power supply is that the larger wire on the flyback should be connected to the front electrode, and the thin wire goes to the inner electrode. It's kind of counterintuitive, but the big wire is actually where the electrons flow towards. So we want the cathode, which is where the electrons come out of, to be in the middle, which happens to come out of the bottom of the transformer. Now I'm going to have to burst your bubble a bit here. The glow from this flame is super dim. All the images you've seen are long exposures. For comparison, here's what it looks like with the lights on. Not, not super impressive, is it? In person, it's bright enough to see when the lights are off, but my camera struggles to pick it up without a long exposure. Like we discussed earlier, flames are bright because most of their light comes from heat glow or black body radiation. Only a very small amount comes from ions recombining and emitting their particular spectra. Since our plasma is basically room temperature, all the light comes from ions emitting light, so it's pretty dim. Though the very high electron temperature does mean that it puts out a lot of UV light, we just can't see it. Now consider that I had to hold my finger in the flame for 30 seconds to get this image, I think it really demonstrates that it's pretty cold. And here it is shooting at some paper. Even directly in the flame for over a minute, nothing happened. It does feel pretty cold to the touch because of the rather significant gas flow. So where do we go from here? Well, now that we have this torch, we plan on using it for a variety of experiments. I really want to try some of that chemistry with it, but it'll take some time to make sure that we do it safely and can quantify it properly. I also plan on writing a paper on this torch design and a lot of the specifics on what it takes to make it work. These things are so fiddly to get working, and the only other plasma torch paper that uses this cheap and readily available power supply ended up with a hot plasma because they did it wrong. So I'm excited to show how it can be done properly. Beyond that, we'll continue to tweak the design and add bits and pieces. I'm exhausted from this project, and I'm pretty burnt out on making torches, no pun intended, but I do want to come back to it and add a microwave emitter to the front to see if we can increase brightness and efficiency of plasma creation. Off camera, I'm going to build a nice box to house all the electronics and a stand for the torch. Then it'll be added as the latest tool in the lab for all my sterilization needs. This project was an absolute monster. A year in the making, dozens and dozens of hours of machining, and even more of testing and retesting things. I almost gave up a few times, but I'm glad I stuck with it as the results are awesome. Point is, getting projects like this working can be very expensive, and it's my supporters here on YouTube, over on Patreon, and now on Ko-fi that make them possible. Many of you ask what I do for a living, and you're looking at it. Making these videos is my full-time job, and it gives me the freedom to explore and create amazing things like this. So thank you so much for your support in keeping these science videos coming. And if you're new and would like to support, then there are some links in the description. If you're looking for more content, then be sure to head over to my other social media pages to see images, sneak peeks, and updates long before they make it into videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.